<clears throat> Thank you for joining us. I'm Beth Leventhal, Executive Director of the Hofstra University Museum, and I'm so thrilled we have a class here with us in African American Studies, as well as members of our faculty and guests from uh, the community. It's tremendous to have you with us. You're probably aware this is the 35th anniversary commemoration of the Soweto Uprising. Uh, which was something we'll hear certainly a lot more about from Les Payne. We're very honored to have been working with Les and Violet Payne, who are with us, both of them today, um, to create this exhibition, which comes from their own collection. And you'll hear more from Les about how this collection came to be uh, while he was covering the uprising for Newsday. Uh, this, is, this exhibit I think exemplifies the type of work that the museum has been doing in recent years to connect students and faculty and the public with ideas and uh, topics that are uh, of great interest to us and that have an, uh, a connective link for all of us in terms of bringing our lives to a more uh, global community and to address issues of multiculturalism and of diversity that are so essential in our 21st century where we are so connected in a blink to all areas of our world. With working with Violet and Les Payne, as I said, it's been a joy. And the works are quite meaningful in this exhibition. And there are five artists from their collection that are highlighted. Uh, uh, there's one work by the sculptor, that sculptor Percy Kunkobe that starts off the exhibit, and you'll hear more about that piece. But the choices uh, that were made were so that you can have an in-depth understanding of where these artists were coming from. And each artist is introduced with wall text that gives you an idea of who they were and what they were hoping to accomplish um, with their art. But to our speaker. And I don't want to talk long because he's really the, the key here today. Uh, Les Payne joined Newsday in the late 1960s. And he served as the associate managing editor for the paper's National Science and International News for a number of years. And in 1968, as an investigative reporter, one of the things he did was to cover the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And in the 1970s, he covered the Black Panther Party. He won his Pulitzer Prize for his 33-part series called The Heroin Trail that tracked the international flow of heroin from the poppy fields of Turkey to New York City. Covering stories throughout the world, in 1976, for Newsday, he did travel to South Africa where he wrote the series on the Soweto Uprising and was again nominated for a Pulitzer Prize for that journalism. One of the things that Les has done in this commemorative 35th year is to take those essays, those, uh, that series on the Soweto Uprising and worked with Newsday to repackage them into this publication, which is fabulous. It's White Power Black Revolt. Um, and we have them for sale, if anyone's interested, for $13 a copy. Um, we also have a catalog that accompanies this exhibition, which is for free. <laughs> but this is a, a piece of history that I think is so pivotal and vital that I would encourage you to, to consider it. And so we are pleased to have with us to talk with you today, um, Les Payne. Thank you, Beth, and uh, I should say to uh, Karen and Tiffany and uh, can you pull this up a little bit? Nancy. Ah. Yes. <laughs> Don't need you. <laughs> who, have, who have been very helpful in um, uh, the exhibit. Last week when uh, uh, we were here, I made point to the group that uh, I'm not an art expert. That, uh, I'm a newspaper man, uh, editor, writer, author, blogger nowadays. Uh, and that what little I knew about art was as a collector. And uh, so uh, 
Beth asked me to come back today to talk about something that I supposedly did know something about, <laughs> which is journalism. And she asked me specifically to talk about the Soweto Uprising, the 35th anniversary, and how I got involved with that story. So uh, <clears throat> what I plan to do is talk a little bit about that, uh, about how I got involved with this, with the, with covering the Soweto Uprising 35 years ago, back when I was in grade school, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and what we encountered when I was over there. And then uh, after which I will comment a little bit about how these artists fit into that landscape. And, uh, and we can take anywhere along the way any questions that you may have about any of that. Um, I uh, got involved with the Soweto Uprising quite by happenstance. Uh, it was 1976. Uh, and I just finished publishing a book on the kidnapping of Patty Hearst called The Life and Death of the Symbionese Liberation Army. And I also, that year, finished an investigation of Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, the, his assassination, which led to uh, the, <clears throat> I shouldn't say led to, but contributed to the exemption of a uh, House subcommittee to look into the assassination of Dr. King along with uh, President Kennedy. So at the end, uh, in 1976, I was looking around for another big story. Uh, but I must say that my wife was not pleased at all with the prospect of me having to go on another overseas assignment. I mean, they, we did have younger children. She's here, by the way, so uh, we'll testify to that. So, but at any rate, on June 16, 1976, the Soweto Uprising erupted uh, when South African students, they skipped classes uh, to protect, protest the government plan and the government had planned to teach uh, basic instructions in the what they call the Bantu schools in the language of Afrikaans. And Afrikaans was the language of the Boers. The Boers were a settler colony there in, in South Africa. And the students were not happy with this at all. Previously, their instructions had been given in English, which they appreciated because even though their schools were segregated and, 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 and uh, were not very good, at least they were being taught in an international language that was a dominant language spoken around the world by enlightened people, scientists, writers, etc. And Afrikaans at that point, that language was spoken only by about 2.4 million people who A, lived in South Africa, B, dominated the government, and C, also happened to have been the oppressors of the 83% of the population of South Africa who were not white. So the students were angry and they took to the streets. Uh, the shot heard around the world was a bullet that killed 13-year-old Hector Peterson. Uh, he was the first student who got shot dead during the demonstration by police in Soweto. Uh, young Peterson has been uh, memorialized as a martyr in a very famous photograph, which was taken by a wire service, not AP or UPI, but I think a European wire service. And it showed Hector Peterson after he was shot being carried by his buddy through a field as he was bleeding to death. Very uh, iconic film. In fact, those of you who may have watched the, uh, the World Cup, or some of you may have gone to see the World Cup, uh, there's a, a museum on the Soweto Uprising, Hector Peterson, a very, very famous uh, photograph uh, that was taken. Now, uh, in addition to that, that piece, the sculpture, and I have to get this right, uh, which is Percy Kankobe. I can't make it. I have to have my mouth try to say it. The host is weak. Okay. It's, it's, it's awesome. <laughs> my my Osa is weak. It is Percy Kankobe. That's this artist right here. It's a sculpture. And this is the uh, his cast and rendition of that famous photograph of Hector Peterson, who is being carried through that field by his uh, buddy. Uh, that's his rendition. It's a very touching, very spiritual thing. And he, and you can read about him, I won't go through all of this because Beth and her staff have done a tremendous job of explaining who each of these artists are. So I won't go through that. I'll just talk about hopefully something that you may not be able to read on the walls. But there it is. And if they say a picture is worth a thousand words, a sculptor is worth two thousand words, <laughs> and so I'll move on. <laughs> So Hector Peterson was perhaps not unlike uh, Ahmed Irhab, who was the first Egyptian who was shot dead in the recent disturbances in Egypt, or like uh, Mohammed Barzizi, won't turn me there either, who was a fruit vendor who was, whose outrage sparked the <coughs> uprising in Tunisia recently. Uh, 
So on the day that uh, Hector Peterson was killed, the day after Hector Peterson was killed, I asked the Newsday editor, David Laventhal, if I could be sent to South Africa to cover the story. Now, this was interesting at that point because Newsday did not have a foreign desk. Uh, I might add that Newsday, once again, does not have a foreign desk, but <laughs> that's another story, and I'm not touching that one. But, uh, and so Dave said, yes, uh, if you can get a visa to go, you can go uh, to Johannesburg and cover the uprising. Now, I knew that as an African-American reporter, it would be very, very, very unlikely that the South African government would grant me a visa to cover that story. And I knew it because Tom Johnson, for instance, who was the bureau chief in uh, Nigeria for the New York Times, uh, had uh, been trying to get into South Africa for a long time. They did not want, they would not want an African-American to cover that story because an African-American, they feared, would get, gain access that white reporters could not gain. And uh, police states particularly are concerned about this. For instance, in Saudi Arabia, when, when I was running the foreign desk in the Middle East, we had a staff of Mohammed Bazi, you know, who was an Arab speaker. He had very, very, he had a hard time getting a visa because he spoke Arabic. He could move readily among the people. They could not watch him, but when they could provide you with an interpreter. So at any rate, they figured that with being an African American, access would be too easy. So they, uh, I knew it was going to be difficult. So what I did is knowing that it was going to be difficult, if not impossible. Oh, by the way, white reporters back then were routinely given a visa to go to Africa, uh, so South Africa, within three weeks. It took them over three weeks. You go, you apply, you take your picture, boom. They wired Pretoria and, and you would be on the plane in three weeks. So knowing that it would be difficult to me, and I suppose this is a lesson this Black History Month, is that when faced with such tough racial challenges, the trick is not always to just yield, and certainly not to compromise, and certainly not anything approaching a principle, to find a way to get around it. So in my case, before applying for a visa, before going to the consulate, I said, okay, how can I get a visa, even though they don't want to give me one? So I knew Arthur Ashe, and at that point, many of you are too young to know it, but Arthur Ashe was a very famous international tennis player. There's one lady shaking her head. She, said she knows him. <laughs> Not everyone here is Generation X or whatever the present generation called. So anyway, so before applying to the visa, I called Arthur Ashe, and uh, and I called him because I knew him casually, and I knew that he had played tennis uh, in somewhat violation of the boycott against South athletes that po posed against South Africa. So he had played before supposedly a desegregated crowd. So he had, I figured, he had chits and contacts and friends in government over there, and he did in fact. In fact, he had a very strong contact with the uh, South African Minister of Sports and Education, a man named Piet Kornoff. So what Ash did, he cabled uh, Kornoff. This was before email, or <laughs> was even quicker than that. You know, so he cabled, or telex, I guess it was. So he telex uh, his good buddy, uh, Piet Kornoff, who's the Minister of Sports and Education, and he said, look, I have a friend, uh, he's a reporter at Newsday, he is not a bomb thrower. He lied about that part. <laughs> <laughs> but he said he is a legitimate reporter, and uh, you know, uh, if you can help him, you know, I'd appreciate it. And so Cornell said, yes, tell him to go to the South African Council and apply. So I said, okay. When the cable came back and took a week or whatever, he came back and, uh, and Arthur asked this now, you can apply. So I went to the South African Council. And I told him, I went to the South African Council. I mean, it was unbelievable. Uh, some of you are old enough to remember the E.F. Hutton commercial, <laughs> in which the whole room just went silent when I walked in. <laughs> All South Africans who were going, this is 1976, by the way, who were going back to their homeland. And in walked this uh, African American, very forthrightly African American reporter, walking up. Uh, and, and so I said, I'd like to, I'm from Newsday, I'm a reporter for Newsday, I'd like to apply for a visa. And, and, and the woman, I never forget this. I don't know why I remember this, but I remember the first thing she did, she looked up at me and she buttoned the top blouse. <laughs> it was the absolute first thing I did. I said, whoa. You know, so, uh, but you get used to this. Usually they, they clutch their pocketbooks. <laughs> this is black history. <laughs> I get that in the restaurants in London. Even my wife said, I don't be so sensitive. But anyway, so, so she buttoned the top blouse. And I said, uh, I still would like to apply for a visa to go cover the story in South Africa. And I'm a reporter for Newsday. And she said, well, it would take a very long time. <laughs> she said, uh, you would have to talk to the Consul General. He's not in. He's out of the country. 
And then I played my niece in the hall. I said, well, Minister Kornoff is awaiting my visa in Pretoria. And I said, I'm a friend of Arthur Ashe. And she said, oh, you know Mr. Ashy? I thought she was going to unbutton her top button. <laughs> but she said, oh, you know Mr. Ashy, you know Mr. Ashy. Uh, so she said, make sure you tell that to the Consul General. Uh, and so I did. So at any rate, uh, still though, the South African government uh, was not content. What they did, they had a $660,000 contract with a public relations firm in New York called Sydney S. Barron's Public Relations Firm. <coughs> And they had an uh, agent who worked for them named uh, Andrew Hatcher. He was an African-American. Andy Hatcher had been a press secretary for in the Kennedy administration. So they assigned him to check me out. He called, asked for dinner, had a nice, nice lunch, very expensive restaurant. And uh, so he asked for files, stories that I'd written. He checked me out of weeks and weeks and weeks. Uh, and at the end of the day, he recommended, Andrew Hatcher for the firm for, for, for South Africa, recommended very strongly that the South African government not grant me a visa. <laughs> in addition to being African American, the Barron's public relations firm was concerned that I was an investigative reporter with a special nose for human rights abuses. And the stories I submitted, you know, I really had to dig to find stories that wouldn't tip them off. A like River Moon had come to Yankee Stadium and put that story in there. You know. <laughs> I covered all of it at one point. I put all of those stories in there, but they went to the file. You know? uh, and they also was concerned that I won a Pulitzer Prize. And his recommendation was that this guy is black, he's a Pulitzer Prize, investigative reporter, he's concerned about civil rights. You don't want him over there, right? Read this story. But the Council General in New York could not overrule the Minister of Parliament. You see, so I had the okay from a member of Parliament, Peter Corner. And so the point is, always find a way to get around these barriers. They're all human. You're human. You can always uh, get around, but you have to. St you can't just dream upon them, or you can't scare them. You have to outthink them. You have to outplan them. You have to find a way to get over barriers. Because news is too important, in my view, to be left to the police state and the president or Mubarak mm -hmm. or his police mm -hmm. or Julianne. <laughs> Call a name from the recent past. So anyway, I arrived in Johannesburg in September and found that most of the reporting by the Western press up until that point, they, by the way, they stalled me for three months. You know, uh, 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 the uprising began on, Ju on June 16th, and I was not able to go until September. So the Sydney S. Baron, they couldn't say no to a member of parliament, but they stalled and stalled and stalled, and they were hoping that Newsday would lose interest or that the uh, revolt, in fact, would be over. And it certainly had run a quite considerable course in three months. But at any rate, in September, uh, I went over, I, I arrived in Johannesburg and found that most of the, of, of the press stories, you know, they were accurate as far as they went, but I found that they were totally incomplete. Number one, the press corps was all white, and the uh, whites were totally barred from the townships. The way it worked is that you could go to Johannesburg, you could go to Cape Town, but you could not go to any of the black townships, which is where the blacks live. You could not go to any of them. Uh, and that's where 83% of the population live. And the foreign press had no access to them because the police kept them. The way it would work is that if you wanted to go into Soweto as a reporter for the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, or Newsday, you would go to the, you had to go to the police commission and say that, uh, you know, I'm less Spain, I want to go and, and interview, uh, I want to go, I would like to go into Soweto, you have to get permission. And then they would say, well, what would you like to do in this? Well, I'd like to interview X, Y, and Z. And then they would think about it and they would say no. And then they would go into Soweto and would knock on the door of X, Y, and Z and say, why is precisely would someone from Newsday want to talk to you? And they would hassle them. And that's, that was the drill. And so at the end of the day, most of these reporters who have been reporting, John Burns, by the way, who's the Washington Bureau Chief, very famous, two Pulitzer Prizes since. You know, I, one he did not deserve. The other one I won't comment on. <laughs> but at any rate, he was a Bureau Chief at that point uh, in Johannesburg. And, uh, and he, like Larry Pringle was there for Newsweek. I don't want to go through all of the names. But, uh, and they were doing the best they can. I mean, you can, if, if the police won't let you in, what are you going to do, you know? Now, what I did uh, is that I, just drove into Soweto. Well, first, I, I didn't drive there right away because they assigned an agent to me full time. Uh, uh, Andy Hatcher, the man who had checked me out 
flew on the plane with me over to Johannesburg. And as soon as we landed in Johannesburg, he turned me over to a, an agent, a man named Clutie, uh, who was my agent to take me around. So he watched me for the first three weeks. You know, he had a program. I had to go here, I had to go there. He was always with me. He called me in the morning. He had all these interviews. You know, so I was in this total program. They watched me for three weeks. And I played my, you know, I was as dumb as they thought most of us are. And so after a while, I said, how smart can this Kaffir be? So they began to relax and relax. And as they relaxed, then I began to go into sweater. And I began, to, I was driving sweater every day. And, uh, and no one would stop me because they thought I was like returning home from work. Luckily, uh, they didn't ask me to speak Parsa <laughs> or Zulu <laughs> or Shandang. Uh, or, or, or any of the uh, uh, present uh, 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 languages here. So uh, <clears throat> the the thing about this is a picture of uh, downtown Johannesburg, which could be Chicago. This is 1976. I took this out of my hotel window, which was the Carlton Hotel. And by the way, to live in a Carlton Hotel or to even move around and get a taxi, since South Africa was totally uh, balkanized in terms of race. Blacks couldn't do anything. In order for me to get a hotel room or to hail a taxi or to take a trip, they had to declare me an honorary white. So I was an honorary white. Uh, unfortunately, it was not reciprocal. I could not make them honorary. But this is uh, Johannesburg, downtown Johannesburg, uh, at, the, at that point. This morning, give me the next slide when you're ready. So in fact, it was very wealthy. Uh, country. The Russians, when the Russians went in there, they were shocked. They thought that South Africa was underdeveloped or medium developed. They got there, it was more developed than Moscow in many ways. South Africa was a very rich country then. It provided at that point 80% of the world's go of the Western world's gold. 80%. You know, it was uh, Johannesburg was literally an area sitting on, 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 on literally on a gold mine, which they had been mining for years. Now, that is the end product of the process of, of, of digging out the gold. That is a uh, gold brick that that uh, fellow is, is finished, put in the finishing touches on. It weighs uh, 25 kilos. And uh, at that point, gold was selling for about $110 an ounce. So that gold brick was worth about $117. I checked today before coming, and today's price of gold is $1,354.87. Those of you wise enough to invest in gold, <laughs> I asked my broker three years ago, as I can tell you, I said, what about gold? He said, nah, you don't want to invest in gold. <laughs> Merrill Lynch. <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, that brick today would be worth about 1.5 million. And they were just cranking those out in this, uh, you know, day of today. You can put the next one in there, right? There was a great gap in South Africa, of course, between the white halves and the black have not. This is a miner with one of those machines that dig into the earth to, to, to dig the gold out. Uh, so uh, blacks had no right to say this. This is a miner here. Uh, this is a young miner, by the way. This first, the one up front is, is 22 years old. The one behind him is about 64. And they both. Am I speaking too long? No, but if you need water, oh. I'm going to have some. <laughs> Let me know when I overstay, but no. <laughs> uh, they're both miners. They both made like $4.30 a day. The older fellow in the back had been working there for like 35 years. He made the same as this young guy who just started. There was no raises. You know, there were no increases. There were no bonuses. You know, and, that, and they lived in a, in a hubble. You know, next slide. And, but this is just... Uh, uh, this is what they lived in. This is what's kind of a hostel that the miners lived in. Um, they were not allowed to bring their families because they could not live in the white areas, you know, unless they um, were working. That was the only uh, reason they could work. Next one. Again, this is another one. This is a this is a family. A family lived in this one. The other one, I think, was, was a male uh, hostel. This is these were people that I interviewed when I was in Soweto, which was off limits for all of the foreign correspondents. They got no real sense of how the Africans were living. And they seemed, strangely enough, not to care much about that. But that's foreign correspondence. Now, a lot of people were confused about what exactly apartheid was and how it exactly worked. A lot of people concerned about racism and how it worked. But the way apartheid worked, I mean, it was a legalized system of racial oppression that was held in place 
by law, by gun, by police, by government. Now, that were three major pillars of, of uh, apartheid. One was the Group Areas Act. And what the Group Areas, and this, this was in law, but the Group Areas Act, uh, the Europeans, by the way, the Europeans were 17% of the population, and the non european of course, were 83% of the population. And the European controlled all the best land. Uh, the Europeans constricted the 83% of the population that was non white to 13% of the worst land. You can do the math. They are 13% of the population. They restrict 80% of the population to 13% of the land, which is to say they, it's a total reverse. They got 83% and of the best land. Okay. Uh, and that's what the Group Areas Act did codify. Then there was the Population Registration Act. The Population Registration Act was that everyone had to register, and you had to register by race so that non whites could be restricted to nine tribal homelands. In other words, those that 13% of the area, they were each person was determined to be a member of a tribe, and that tribe had some little spot of land. For instance, Nelson Mandela was a uh, Tosa, and so he, was, uh, he belonged to the Trans Scott, little spot of land. That's where all of his, the courses were. The Zulus were in KwaZulu, and that's where they were. And so, but it added up to 13% of the land. And so, you had to register, and they were very strict about this. And the other thing was influx control. And what the influx control law was that you had no right, if you were not white, you had no right to be in that 83% unless you had a pass. And that's what the influx control was. We've heard about pass laws. This, ooh, this is, these are what they call petty apartheid laws. I mean, this fellow here is coming out of a non-European public facilities in a building. All buildings had this, you know, they had non-European, of course, the Europeans were plush or luxurious somewhere, but anyway, that's, that's how that worked. Uh, in addition to these major pillars, there were some 350 separate pieces of legislation in South Africa, which was called petty apartheid. One was that blacks would, uh, would use separate facilities and, and whites at all times. Uh, and I must say, since this is Black History Month, that uh, I mean, I was there, and this, you know, as strange as it sounds, even then, you know, it wasn't really new to me. Yeah. I mean, I was born in Alabama. I was born in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, uh, in the 40s. Yes, in the 40s. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and some of these laws I knew, now a lot of people know that the Civil Rights Bill was, bill was passed in 1976, and they think, they think that all it did was to uh, make Dr. Martin Luther King popular, I suppose. And, and some things, well, they gave blacks the vote, and well, it did uh, this, and it did that. But what really affected me, and I, I lived in Alabama until I was 12 years old, 12 years old was the so-called petty uh, racist laws. And, and I just brought a list of them, so you may be familiar with some of them. I'll just read you a couple of these. This is from Alabama. I know this is a digression from South Africa. This is from Alabama, when I grew up, when I was born. This is my family subjected to. This was written into the law in Alabama, state law. It says, nurses. No person or corporation shall require any white female nurse to nurse in wards or rooms in hospitals, either public or private, in which Negro men are placed. No white nurse in a, in a hospital room if there is a Negro man there. Man there. Uh, restaurants. It's in Alabama. Birmingham, Montgomery, all these places. Uh, it, and this was until 1966, by the way. Restaurant. It shall be unlawful to conduct a restaurant or other place for the serving of food in the city at which white and colored people are served in the same room, unless such white and colored persons are effectively separated by solid partition, extending from the floor upward to a distance of seven feet or higher, and unless a separate entrance from the street is provided for each compartment. Pool. I don't know if I have to think about pool and billiard. Maybe they may thought we were going to beat them. I don't know. <laughs> pool and billiard. It shall be unlawful for a Negro and white person to play together or in company with each other at any game of pool or billiards. Go figure. But this is what I grew up on. So my getting into uh, South African Soweto and I saw all this stuff, I, you know, it was struck me as, 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 as familiar. The difference between, uh, there are many differences, obviously, uh, in comparing anything, but one of the uh, major differences between the U.S. codified racism 
uh, that was codified after slavery, which was another story, uh, and apartheid in South Africa was that these Jim Crow laws in South were enacted by a white majority against a black minority. And they were enforced chiefly in the South, where I was born. In South Africa, these apartheid laws were enacted by the white minority, 13%, against the black majority who had lived on the land since time began. I mean, they were European. In fact, they had signs. You see what it says? It says non-European. So they, they considered themselves European. So they were, they were not African, but European. So these were the European settler colonies who put in these laws into place for people who had always lived in Africa. Okay. So as, as President Obama might say, this probably wasn't sustainable. <laughs> <laughs> One would think, but they thought it would last a thousand years. They said, oh, this would last a thousand years. But at any rate, um, not unlike the uh, Jim Crow laws, the 350 pieces of so-called petty apartheid legislation covered all aspects of social, political, and economic contact between whites and black when I, when I got there. Uh, uh, you know, you, you read it, but it was just stunning how it was enacted. That was a Bantu Education Act. And the Bantu Education Act, which was uh, drafted by the notorious Dr. Henry Vervold, which is a name that people familiar with that history of that part of the world will remember, it stated flatly that the goal of education, apartheid education, was to snuff out all aspiration that black students might hold for employment as anything other than, quote, laboring jobs under white supervision, unquote. Blacks were not to be educated, but to be trained as hewers of wood and drawers of water. No African could hold a job where he or she supervised a white. Nowhere in the country. No matter how much experience, how expertise, you can never hold a job you know, where you supervise a white. Uh, black, black workers were not allowed to strike, ever. In the semi-skilled trades, uh, Africans were not allowed to apply the finishing touches to jobs. In the butcher shop, for instance, they could not handle the caucus. You know, they couldn't carry that. You know, some white person would have to do that. In the housing trade, I found this was mentioned, they could not apply the final coat of paint on a wall. They could apply the primer, they could apply the secondary coat, but the final coat of paint had to be applied by the white. It come in and put the final coat on. It was written down in law. I mean, it wasn't kind of policy. I mean, it's in the law, you know. Uh, and, the, and of course, there was a Prohibition of Marriage Act, which outlawed marriages between white people and people of any other race, including Asians and so-called mixed-race colors. Marriage were illegal starting in 1947. Sex between the races was also outlawed and considered a felony crime under the Immorality Act. Sexual relationship between whites and anyone else was... Uh, uh, a felony by law and it was enforced. This is not one of those laws that was on the book that no one ever paid any attention to. Now on the question of mixed race, we hear this mixed race in this country a lot. In 1947 that's when the Boers came into power and they drafted the mixed race law and, and one of the things, and I interview people and, and if you, those of you who want to read that story, uh, what, what you'll, that, that the Newsday series I wrote about the colors so-called in that piece and um, and the colors constituted about 9% of the population of South Africa back then. And when that law was passed in 1947, before it was passed, it was always illegal for blacks and whites to marry, but colors and whites could marry. And some colors and whites had, in fact, married, particularly in the Cape Town area. But when the law was passed and enforced, the whites who had married colors had to make some drastic decisions. 1947, they had to make some decisions. Now it is illegal. So, under, under the uh, Immorality Act and the, uh, what they call the, uh, uh, the Marriage Act, the Prohibition of Marriage Act, that's the official title. So, now you have a white man or woman married to a colored man or woman, and now that's illegal. They've been married 10 years, I, I interviewed a couple, in fact, the, the children of a couple that have been married for 20 years ago, this, this, this girl is 21, 20 years old. And so they had to make a decision. They had to, they could get a divorce. They could leave the country. Some did, who could afford it. They could commit suicide. There were many who took this route, by the way. Or the white partner could be reclassified as a colored. So you would go, now the colored could not go and be reclassified as a white. So, but when, when this 
white member was reclassified as a colored. And I talked to a family that were here, where colored, the, the father, who was white, uh, was reclassified as a colored. And when he was reclassified as a colored, he had to move, they had to move out of the house because colors couldn't live there where they lived. So he had to move into another house. And he, though he kept the same job, he was very experienced, very valued, very meritorious on his job. But when he was classified a color, his pay was cut in half because he was now a color. And he could not supervise any whites anymore. So it was a very, very strange place. So the Soweto Uprising. Uh, initially kicked off because of the language issue, but when adults saw their children getting shot down and brutalized by the police, they joined in and the long list of grievances against apartheid, petty apartheid and otherwise, were setting uh, toilets, not white. This is in the Carlton Hotel Center, by the way, a very five-star hotel, which is where I stayed. Uh, same, didn't matter. In fact, in the newspaper, the liberal newspapers are not, they had separate facilities for, for blacks and whites in, in the newspaper, actually. This is a reference book. Whenever you were in the white area, all Africans had to carry this book. You know, if you were stopped without this book, if you didn't have your reference book or pass book, you know, you could be arrested. And, and if you had a book and you weren't working, they would send you back to, if you were closer, they would send you back to the trench guard. And my being an honorary white, I didn't have to carry one of these. <laughs> That's what that meant. So if I was stopped, I'd say, look, I'm honorary white. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, you can't, you can't touch me. <laughs> I don't need a pass. I'm honorary white, man. You know, it's crazy. But uh, so that that was the, the pass that that uh, they had to be carried. Uh, now the killing was disturbing this one, on, on many levels. Uh, this is this is what the demonstration. This is again these were students uh, who were demonstrating. These are the cops. Next one, you get a sense of it. Next. <coughs> These uh, trucks here were called hippos, and what would happen is police would drive around, and they called them hippos because they were covered for, for weather purposes, and they had gun ports on the side of them as they would drive through these black communities, and they had pretty good shots, and, and as you can see, they were, they were heavily armed. Excellent. <coughs> now, uh, one of the things, it, the, the, the death toll uh, the South Africans, obviously, government uh, tried to keep it down. They said that, well, you know, it's only, they would say only 250 Africans were killed in the entire country. But again, this is about the time I got there in September. They said, oh, 250 Africans have been killed. And now I'm in, I was going, making my rounds in South Africa, in Soweto, and everywhere I would go, the Africans would tell me there's far more than 250. So I said, well, how many? They said, well, we don't know. It's far more than 250. They're killing, they're dropping them out at sea, they're burying them in Pompa's grave, far more than 250. And so everywhere I went, I heard this. You know, I was reporting on other stories, filing just about every day. Um, and, 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 but I kept hearing this. And I would run it by my uh, white uh, colleagues. They didn't, they didn't see any story. They didn't much care. What they would do, they would just take the word of the Minister of Justice, and the Minister of Justice man named Jimmy Kruger. Jimmy Kruger said 250. You go to bank with that. All right. I talked to the Africans. They said far more. And so I kept it, so it began to uh, bother me after a while. And the reason why it bothered me, and I suppose it didn't bother the white correspondents so much, is because I was making the rounds and I was talking to Africans who were searching in hospitals, roadside, morgues, looking for their missing relatives around the clock. And I felt that journalism had a duty to address this body count issue, if for no other reason than to get some kind of closure, closure, you know, with, with, with the family, so they don't know. Did their 16-year-old kid escape to Swaziland, which was he or she in the hospital, were they in the ditch somewhere, were they in the morgue? You know, no one told them, no one knew. And so this is why I began to, to uh, uh, try to look into this. Uh, I felt that we could get a better calibrated uh, uh, number that would make sense for, for the Africans there. Now, the body count, the official body count was a state secret. If you went to the uh, Justice Department, it was a state secret how many they had killed. This way. Next one. You got a sense of it. Next one. Next. 
That's me talking with one of the uh, fugitive students. One of the, he is the number one fugitive. No, he's the number one student leader of, of the rebellion at that point. And, and, and uh, when well, he was on the lam, the, the number one guy was a guy named C.H.C. Machinini who had escaped because he was so hot. The police had a price on his head. They were looking for him everywhere. Uh, this is Corso Ciotolo. You know, I met him late one night. And he was a student leader. He was explaining to me how things were. Now, obviously, if they had found me with him or him by himself, it was long gone, you know, for at least him. But me being an honorary white, who knows? <laughs> but so this death figure, the death count bothered me because for these reasons, seeing these bodies, pitch up every day. So I said, I'm going to try to get to the bottom of it. So what I did is I put together a list in Soweto. Soweto at that point had a population of 1.6 million people living 16 miles from Johannesburg. It was a labor camp, basically. Africans from all quote unquote tribes lived there and worked in Johannesburg and the mines and elsewhere. And so I would uh, make my rounds there and so I got a list of all the funeral homes uh, in Soweto. There were uh, 32 memory serves, uh, funeral homes, uh, black run, black home. And uh, so I would get the list and I would go to each of them. Now the thing about the Boers is that they write everything down, like the Germans, everything is down, written on a paper somewhere. You know, uh, England, you know, you study countries when you, when, you, when you go abroad as foreign correspondent. England, they don't write, they're not good at record keeping. They haven't gotten around to writing their constitution yet, hardly. But, uh, but the Germans write everything down, the Dutch write everything down. So I, I said, well, it, it must be at these, require these funeral directors to put down the number of people who were killed. So I would go there. Uh, and I remember the first half dozen I went to, I would go, knock on, knock on the wall, ring the bell or whatever, and say, I'm, I'm Les Payne from Newsday, Long Island newspaper, owned by the Times Mirror, I read 350 newspapers, and da 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 da. How many people did you bury who were killed relative to the disturbance here? And he would look at me and say, look, you're from New York, or Long Island, wherever that is. <laughs> he said, You'll be back home and I'll be in prison under okay. Section 6 of the Terrorism Act. Which okay. they, can, they can arrest him for that. He said, no, I'm not going to tell you that. And so that's the answer I was getting. First, six, seven, eight. And they're not going to tell me. So finally, one day I went to one of the funeral homes and uh, it was during the lunch break. And there was a woman there who was not the owner. And she was not, uh, I think she was related to the owner. She was not the owner. And by the way, I mean, tip to you who are reporters or watch reporting or a student of reporting. I'm perfecting my rap. You know, my first day I'm just saying, give me the names of the people you bury rioters. Now it is, look, I'm just paying for Newsday, Long Island newspaper, you know, the world must know. These are not flies, these are not, not rodents, these are human beings. We have to know so that their pressure can be put on. The world must know that. And so I was getting better and better at this. And so this woman said to me, she said, look, I'll tell you what. She said, uh, if you were to come back after closing, she said, I'll write down the number of people that we buried at this funeral home. If you come back after closing, I'll give you, the, I'll give you this list. And so she wrote down the name, the official, so I got it. So I said, ah, that's what I have to do. So I have to wait until the owner leaves. Yeah. So I would wait. You know, sometimes I would sit outside in the hot sun in the car, you know, and read a book or something, and wait until the owner left. And then I would go and talk to uh, the, the assistant or the woman or whoever was in charge. Uh, and then they began to, so I began to compile a list. I began to get a pile of names and circumstances. And so I, I got a, uh, pretty quickly, it took me two, three weeks of doing this story and other stories to, to compile this list. And then though I knew that this was not good enough because this is a list from funeral home that could be challenged plus they could not stand behind it because they would be arrested under section six. So I said, I gotta find out the official, I gotta find out the official record. So again, knowing that the Boers and the Dutch would write everything down, I said, at the courthouse there must be a record. And I found out there was a record uh, at the inquest court. The people who killed, I went to the inquest court, and uh, it was hard for me to get in because they didn't have an interest in the inquest court for African-Americans, even honorary ones. <laughs> you know, so I had to go get help to get into the court. So I, I went there with a friend of mine. And am I, should I just break this off? Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll wrap this up. <laughs> oh, all right. Um, so I, 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 got, I, I went to the inquest court. And I had a tip, I heard a tip that the inquest court had a list of those people who were killed Ryan. So I went there with a friend of mine who was a reporter, and we went in and, and I said, you know, we were acting as if we were dumb, didn't know much, and told them we were looking for people who had been killed. And so she gave us, she threw this big book on the desk. And the first thing I noticed was that there was this list, ledgers, list, list, list. And then there was an R 
you know, circled by some of the names. And then I asked what that meant. She said it meant Raya connected. So then I began to count those. Bottom of the line is that there were 250 people that officially had been killed at that point. I compiled a list of 853. And I had names, dates, and circumstances. And the South African, and I, by the way, I knew that was a very sensitive story. And even, so what I did rather, now, the way we got stories out in those days is that you didn't, you, you telex them. You would go to telex office, you would type the story out at home, portable typewriter in the, in the hotel room. <laughs> no computers, no internet, <laughs> forget it. You know, <laughs> you had this portable typewriter, you type your story out with car and paper, you would go to the telex department, or you could go to your hotel, and then they would retype it on telex and send it to uh, uh, Garden City uh, at that point. And so, uh, but I know that they wouldn't send this story, hmm. seeing that the South African had understated the number of children they have shot down by a factor of 250%. There's no way they're going to send that. If they did, you know, that would be great trouble, honorary, white, or not. So I remember going to the airport and uh, meeting someone who was flying uh, a British airline coming back to New York. And I said, look, you know, I'm a reporter for Newsday, and I gave him the story and some rolls of film. He said, someone from Newsday will meet you on the other end. You know, that's how I got the story uh, back that year. And uh, so, now, the uh, South African government was really uh, very, very upset. And the reporter who uh, worked with me, uh, a fellow named Enoch Duma, I found out later after I left the country that they arrested him. I mean, as soon as I left, they knocked on his door. And uh, they, they hauled him off on a Section 6 of terrorism. He was a reporter for the Sunday Times. Sunday Times was a local paper that went to Soweto, basically. And they hauled him off. Uh, to, to, to prison and uh, uh, held him, beat him mercilessly. In fact, uh, I, I later talked to someone who witnessed it, and, and there's uh, many things heartbreaking about that story. Uh, but one of them was 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 this story. Him, uh, my wife met him. He later escaped, and in fact, he visited us at, at, at home. He did it. and they they took him when they took him to the hospital. The first, I mean, to the uh, head, police headquarters that first day. Uh, he didn't know why he was being arrested. He was a reporter, you know, well known. And uh, as a black reporter for the black edition of the Sunday Times, and so they took him to the police station. The uh, cop took off his blouse, put it on the chair, walked around. So he didn't know what was coming. So he said, "You know, he was thinking, what could he have done? What had he done?" And his first question was, is, "Do you know Mr. Payne?" Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so Enoch said, "No." <laughs> and so this cop hauled off and hit him in the chest, knocked him over the desk, and Enoch said, "Oh, Les." <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, but it's. And he said, "Well, you know, he never told me his first name, and then it was downhill from there." Some of the, I mean, I, I didn't write about that kind of detail, but but some of the general detail of, of the brutality against journalists and others uh, is in that is in that series. If you can borrow someone's copy, who buys one? I said, <laughs> uh, or buy one. Um, so the the, but the thing that. Obviously, it was much worse than that was the sheer number uh, itself. Because what I found that these were young students, for the most part. And there was just one line where someone said, some white uh, South African asked, why should we be shooting students because they don't want to learn our language? Why are we killing, shooting students down because they don't want to learn our language, Africans? Which is a good question. And, and what I found was that uh, most of these were young people. 35% uh, of those uh, who killed were teenagers, shot down for the most part. Some of those pictures you saw that. 35% of them were teenagers. 80% of them were less than 30 years old. At least 10 were younger than 12. And half a dozen were less than 6 years old. And, uh, and I, hearing that, so in the name of God, could a 6 year old get caught up in this? And so what I found, I, I looked and found out this one five years, I re, kind of, I wouldn't say investigated, but I, I reported out fully. And what had happened is that with the kids, the kids are kids. And what we do when these hippos that you saw earlier would drive through, they would run to the country and give the black cows who they run. Them. That's what they do. That's why they told them. And this one five year old <coughs> had, uh, when the hippos drove through, had ran and gave the black cows who they and, and they opened and tore their head up with, with a bullet right now. Five years old. And I happen to talk to a parent. I mean, it's just unbelievable, you know, to, to witness this kind of uh, uh, stuff. So at any rate, uh, interestingly, uh, again, you know, the official figure was, depending on what paper you read, was either 250 or somewhat 
said maybe as many as 300. And uh, in fact, I had a buddy, uh, Ken, <laughs> on the copy this in the New York Times, who told me that uh, after my story ran in Newsday, uh, that the New York Times, who had previously been saying, I think nearly 300, began to say magically more than 600. <laughs> Without any particular reason. <laughs> they didn't get all the way to 800 and said more than 600 have been killed. And they did not attribute it to uh, the Justice Minister Kruger, which is where it had previously been uh, attributed. So, what happened is that when, when this story and others appeared, my 11 part series appeared, uh, I was banned from South Africa. Uh, uh, not only was I banned, but Newsday was banned. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and what would happen is that. Uh, uh, again, this is 1976, and in, in the 80s, in 1984, and there, really, the story began to be really hot again. Uh, it was on the 7 o'clock news then, every night. Some headlines of the paper, because there was another disturbance. We talked about Winnie Mandela and Steve Biko, and it was, you know, it was, there was the next level of the struggle that had begun with the sort of uprising in 1976. And um, so we couldn't go. Peter Eisner, who was my foreign editor, I said, Peter, we have to get somebody over there. So, you know, he... He would send someone, a reporter, to, uh, to uh, the South African consulate. And, uh, and first I would say, first of all, Peter, you know, tell us a reporter. And, and uh, no one can then feel free. I was the system managing editor. He was a foreign editor working, reporting to me. I said, tell this reporter that if it comes up, tell them they can denounce me. You know, <laughs> tell them, you know, they don't like my mother. <laughs> you know, I won't read any of their stories. You know, they don't like me. You know, and they, and they I'm sure, would do that. And then uh, I'm told that uh, the, the uh, consulate officer would say, but does Mr. Payne still work for the paper? Mm -hmm. And say, yes, well, these are denied. Mm -hmm. And their view was that as long as I worked for the paper, they wouldn't grant a visa. This is what Eisner himself, you know, and these were white reporters at Newsday who were, who were going there. We wouldn't get a visa and told them that uh, Newsday would not get a visa to work in South Africa as long as I worked for the paper. And uh, once again, you have this insurmountable thing. Now, my view is that, as I thought before, that this stuff is too important uh, for the South African government, the council general, to decide who that 83% of the black majority there is going to be covered by. So, just to show Peter and others, I snuck back into the country officially. You know, uh, I want to get into it so I can wrap this up, but if you're interested, we can talk about that or beer or later or whatever. But I snuck back to the country just to show them that it can be done. Now, I snuck back over the country in 1985 and spent a month there writing about what was going on at that point. All right. Unbeknownst to them, I remember when I got back, I was on Barry Farber's show. We were talking about South Africa. And, uh, and then Barry said, well, We were talking about South Africa. And Barry said, Well, hold it, we have the Consul General from South Africa on. Back after the break. <laughs> you know, so we came back after the break, and the South African Consul General said, Mr. Payne has been talking about South Africa, but I wonder if he told the listeners when was he last there. <laughs> I figured that I would say 1976. I said, well, I just got back last week. <laughs> he said, what, what, we don't, we don't know anything. I have it on tape, by the way, <laughs> it's really funny. You know, we don't know anything about this. You know. But at any rate, that's what journalism is, that's what reporting is, that's what finding information is. I mean, you can't be at the mercy of uh, mainstream journalists, you can't be at the mercy of, of, of police or the president or the prime minister. These stories have to be discovered and written about, which is the lesson of Soweto. Uh, and the final one is that, uh, again, so officially I'm still banned, and uh, around Thanksgiving of 1989, I get a call, and someone said, South African Council wants to speak to you, me, still assistant managing editor. Uh, like the miners, I hadn't gotten a pay raise. No. <laughs> and I'm uh, still system managing editor. And uh, so he said, I said, well, who is this really? And I thought it was a joke. And so I got his phone. I said, okay, who is this really? He said, this is South African Congress Congress General. I think his name was Duke Kent Brown. Uh, so he said, uh, is this Mr. Payne? I said, yeah. He said, uh, would you like to go to South Africa? <laughs> And I said, who is this really? <laughs> he said, no, this is the Council General of South Africa, you know. And I said, well, I'm sure, even though I was an editor, I, I, I still had a column. I said, well, this news, I'm sure the news they would send me if I got permission. The hot stories all over the paper, I said, sure, we'll go. Uh, so he said, well, let's see, the parliament meets in February, and said, what about the first week in February? I said, fine. He said, we'll give you a meeting the first week in February. What that meant was, that's when we knew Nelson Mandela was going to be released. 
You see, because not because of me, but because students, unlike like these here, had picketed, boycotted at Columbia, and all these students have divested, and they had forced the U.S. Congress to override a, a Ronald Reagan veto and impose economic sanctions on South Africa because of Soweto, because of what happened in 1984, because of students' concern about mankind that they don't know. They were far more concerned than the callous reporters that I encountered, who really were. But then I probably have callous too, you know, uh, when it comes to, I don't know, East Timor, you know. <laughs> so um, we, we have our area of interest. And uh, so uh, they invited me back into uh, uh, South Africa. And then uh, Nelson Mandela was released, I think, on whatever it was, the seventh, and I was, you know, permitted to go back in on the fourth. And so I was among those who, uh, you got know, the next slide. So yeah, well, that's, there it is. In his backyard in Orlando West. He had just been released that Sunday. And uh, after being banned, Newsday being banned, I had been banned for all of those years, when Nelson Mandela was released and apartheid was ended, uh, I was invited back in. The reason why they invited me back in by name, and I think the only one who invited me in by name, is because one of the conditions for the uh, economic sanctions against South Africa was that the country had to prove that it was irreversibly on the road away from uh, apartheid, irreversibly. And they had to unban the ANC, they had to release Nelson Mandela. And the reporters who had been covering all this, the South African government apparently reason did not have the credibility or even if they did have the credibility, someone who had been thrown out would have even more credibility to say whether or not now that they are returning irreversibly. And so, get it right, tell the truth, and duck, and you're, you'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that's it for the South, for, for, for the South African Soweto uprising. And let me say one thing about, these artists here, by the way, all work during that period. Uh, the youngest one is Nzima. He was born in 1959. And you can see that a lot of his work is after uh, 1990. 1990 is a dividing point when uh, apartheid ended, when Nelson Mandela was released and they began to turn away. He, he was elected president in 1994. So you can see how bright and upbeat Nzima's work is. You know, he, well, he's the most technically skilled of, of the artists, too, by the way. You know, uh, the rest of them were, were, were trained, but. Uh, there's, a, there's an optimism, optimism that has, has crept in. Uh, if you look at uh, some of the paintings, like if you look at the, uh, David and Dale, the man on the, on the far wall there, most of the uh, figures, they have their eyes closed, and uh, the staff here have put on the wall that they asked him why were the eyes closed on so many of, the, of, the, of his figures, and his point was that the, the eyes were closed because they did not want to face in a direct way the suffering that they were enduring. Mm -hmm. And so his eyes were always closed. And what you see is that, so what he, he was a township artist. That's not to say that he was not talented or trained or technically advanced. It is to say that he, his subject matter was mainly the township. And he, he walked about people in the mine, uh, people in Toledo playing cards, uh, uh, corn, making corn, playing uh, checkers, chess, whatever, uh, singing in the choir, playing music. He was a township artist, and again, eyes were always closed because of the period, because of what they were going through. Uh, uh, Sauli, Winston Sauli, who in my view is, and, and by and a lot of folks here is considered the best, highly collected, particularly in Europe, Germany, and, 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 uh, uh, and, and Australia. Uh, very technically advanced, it's so fortunate him. And you can almost look and tell which of the uh, uh, pieces of his work that were painted after or drawn after 1990. Because uh, a dough, see the little dough, he, he began to creep into his work. Um, you see it here. You know the eyes are still closed. That would never happen before. He was the most, uh, Winston Chaudhuri was the most political of all of these artists, by the way. He, when he was 22 years old, he had attended uh, an ANC meeting. This was Nelson Mandela Youth Organization. He had he was called attending a youth uh, uh, Mandela ANC meeting, and he was arrested under Section Six of the Terrorism Act. And the record is he was put in prison in solitary confinement for nine weeks, and I think he ended up serving something, something like nine months in prison without charge. 
for having attended the meeting. So he was the artist, 22 years old. He intended to uh, uh, produce art. He could not, and none of them could not, uh, paint, draw, illustrate what was happening in the streets. They would have been hauled off right away. So he did very, usually abstract work. Uh, Winston saw we uh, Smack this one over here with drums, with the faces on the drums. That's typical of his work. Uh, this one here on the other side is kind of a moody, uh, it was always kind of a surrealistic kind of uh, uh, atmospheric about his work. Um, like here, this is, you can look at this and say, because you see the dove image, you know it's after 1990. I think this is in 1992. But it doesn't matter, you look at it, you know it's after that. And, and when you see the eyes, always look at, not always, but look at the eyes, you see patterns. Now, what this, these are two of this is a white woman, this is an uh, African woman. How can you can tell? You get the nose, you get the hair, right? Now, this is 1992, her eyes now are closed. The African woman's eyes are open. And, and it's not an accident. A lot of his work that is even more, not even more, but more abstract than that, you find very clear rendition of him making a point about uh, the dawning of the post-apartheid South Africa. Now, these artists are not, as uh, Albert Murray would say, uh, art is not uh, politics, is not politics, is not propaganda. Art is about the human consciousness. So these artists are artists in the real sense. What they are doing is capturing the sense of the human consciousness. But human consciousness as reflected in their subject is what they are rendering here. So they're not making this up. So this is what they are bringing away from, 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 their, from, from their people. And uh, these are people who, who lived in the country. There was a, there are other uh, uh, artists in the collection, for instance, a man who was very, very popular during the apartheid period, mainly because he did not uh, paint strictly African features. He, his features, they had kind of wavy hair. You kind of couldn't tell. It was kind of like, uh, Sue Simmons. No, <laughs> Mariah Carey. I mean, is she? Or is she? Yeah, no, you know. So, because his art was rendered that way, I mean, it sold. It was very popular across the board. Bernard Macala, M A C A L A, and uh, one of the things, and, and he was very prolific. And a lot of his paintings before 1990, you know, the eyes were always downcast. The hands were always downcast. And then after 1990, the eyes of, of his subject were always open. They asked him why. He said he was not aware of it. It was an unconscious thing. And it was unconscious because he wasn't really doing as a cartoonist would or the newspaper cartoonist. He was not trying to make a polemical statement. What he was doing is he was kind of rendering what he saw. And so he saw a new joy and a new sense of optimism and a new sense of light that were coming into them. And so I think if you watch the eyes on some of these people, not in everything, don't, don't be like some... Uh, literary uh, so, uh, uh, English teachers I used to have. I mean, they used to find connections between everything. But don't always do it, but just look and see what you see there. Thank you.